Hello and welcome to our Cenotaph Tour 2020. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Megan and I'm the museum educator here at the Kamloops Museum and Archives. I would like to begin today with a land acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge that we are located onto Kamloops Te Shaquatan territory within the traditional and unceded lands of the Shaquatan Nation. I'd like to begin our tour today by sharing a quote that has always resonated with me from Mojus Eckstein's book, Walking Since Daybreak. He said, we arrived twice in reality and subsequently in collective remembrance. The reality is now beyond our reach and the remembrance constitutes history. What I am going to share with you today is the remembrance of the First and Second World Wars in Kamloops, as well as the post-war period and modern conflict. I'd like to begin by highlighting the cenotaph itself. Cenotaph is Greek in origin and means empty tomb, so kinos, empty, and tapos, tomb. It is worth noting that unlike other war memorials, cenotaphs contain no artifacts, are not associated with buildings or statuary, and do not contain any human remains. So some of you may be familiar with the National War Memorial, which is typically quite ornate. We also have the Grave of the Unknown Soldier um, in front of that. And war memorials, by contrast, are typically much larger. Um, they're much more decorative, and they offer a celebration of military service, while cenotaphs tend to convey sorrow and mourning. Memorialization of wars is very much a post-First World War phenomenon. The violence and massive loss of life of the First World War were shocking and something to be preserved and remembered. Built in 1925, as a wave of commemoration swept across Canada along with most of the world, this cenotaph stands here in Memorial Park. And if you think of some of the other war memorials in Europe that may be familiar to us, uh, Vimy Ridge goes up in 1936, the Upfell Ridge and the Menin Gate uh, in 1932 and 27, respectively. Um, and it's worth noting as well that the Menin Gate has a ceremony that has been carried out every evening from 1927 onwards, save a brief break during the Second World War. And I think it's worth noting that many of these memorials in Europe bear the scars of the Second World War, um, including bullet holes and shrapnel damage. And for the most part, this has simply been left. For those who are interested in the phenomenon of commemoration, particularly here in Canada, I highly recommend Death So Noble, written by Jonathan Vance, which looks at the way that commemoration has shaped our collective memory of the First World War. Now here in Kamloops, some of you may be familiar with our reserve unit, the Rocky Mountain Rangers. And the Rangers formed in 1898. And in 1902, an armory was built for them um, in the 300 block of Battle Street. Um, and it served as something of a community center until the 1920s. This isn't an uncommon phenomenon. Often armories with their large open battle squares um, serve as a community space for dances and fairs, sometimes even car shows as we get a little later into history. And the Rocky Mountain Rangers never actually served together as a unit overseas. Um, although they deployed overseas during the First World War as the 102nd and 172nd, um, they were disbanded once they got there to serve as reinforcements. Um, many would serve with the Seaforth Highlanders in the 72nd Battalion at Vimy Ridge and Passchendaele, um, as well as the 54th, the 2nd Canadian Mounted Rifles, the 7th Battalion, Canadian Expeditionary Force, um, and the 47th Battalion. It is worth noting that many Rocky Mountain Rangers also served here on the home front, where terrorism was a real and present threat. In 1915, the Kamloops Inland Sentinel notes a dynamite explosion at the railway bridge in St. Croix, which severely damaged the bridge, perpetrated by a U.S. German man named Van Horn. Um, we also had a number of internment camps here at Morrow Lake, Revelstoke, Monashi, Vernon, Edgewood, and Fernie. There were 8,579 prisoners interned there, largely Austro-Hungarian in their roots. And here in Kamloops, following the First World War, we had 189 war dead, and that's out of a population of roughly 4,000 people. Um, and this is something that we see fairly commonly in the First and Second World Wars in British Columbia, that we typically have quite high rates um, <coughs> of deaths coming home. And this is largely because for British Columbians who wanted to serve in the war effort, uh, serving overseas was often their only avenue for participation. The Rocky Mountain Rangers received battle honors from the First World War, including Arras, Hill 70, Ypres, Amiens, the Hindenburg Line, and Valenciennes. I'd like to focus in on a First World War soldier, specifically Edward Donald Bellew, who was a Victoria Cross winner who died here in Kamloops and is actually buried in the city. He's an interesting character right from the start. So on his attestation papers, Bellew is actually listed as being born on the high seas, although some uh, other sources have suggested that he's at, he was actually born in Bombay, India. His father was also in the military and was a colonel at the time of his death. 
And Bellew was a civil engineer by trade and a lieutenant in the 18th Royal Irish Regiment, so in the British Army, which he would have likely seen service in the Boer War, um, but of course this wouldn't be reflected in his Canadian records. Um, and it's sort of an interesting side note that research about First World War British soldiers is often complicated by the fact that many of those records were burned or destroyed during the bombing of London in the World, Second World War. So although Bellew and his wife lived in North Vancouver when war broke out, he actually enlisted in Valcartier in Quebec. Um, and this is somewhat surprising, and the reasons aren't really apparent in his attestation papers. Um, but he was certainly not the only one who was enlisting elsewhere. So it's a very common trend that we see in both the First and Second World Wars, where soldiers will enlist where they think they have the best chance of seeing service overseas. Um, so typically for young men from Kamloops, that's typically Vernon, Vancouver, or Victoria that they're enlisting. Um, so Bellew is a, an atypical example enlisting in Valcartier, but Valcartier is typically known as the last stop for Canadian soldiers before they head overseas, so that may be part of the reason why he's enlisting there. His wife joined him in London, um, which is an option that not many families had. And I think it's worth noting that during both the First and Second World Wars, one of the stories that's typically untold is that of women on the home front who are struggling to make ends meet, um, and men who are leaving well-paying jobs in order to serve. Now, Lieutenant Bellew had an extremely interesting war, perhaps an atypical experience. Um, he was award awarded the Victoria Cross, which some of you may know already is the highest military honor for Commonwealth soldiers. And I'd like to read you the citation for his award because it happens very early on. For most conspicuous bravery and devotion near Kierselaire on 24th April 1915, during the German attack on the Ypres salient, Captain, then Lieutenant Bellew, as battalion machine gun officer had two guns in action on the high ground overlooking Kierselaire. The enemy's attack broke in full force on the morning of the 24th against the front and right flank of the battalion, the latter being exposed owing to a gap in the line. The right company was soon put out of action, but the advance was temporarily stayed by Captain Bellew, who had sighted his guns on the left of the right company. Reinforcements were sent forward, but they in turn were surrounded and destroyed. With the enemy in strength less than 100 yards from him, with no further assistance in sight, and with his rear threatened, Captain Bellew and Sergeant Peerless, each operating a gun, decided to stay where they were and fight it out. Sergeant Peerless was killed and Captain Bellew was wounded and fell. Nevertheless, he got up and maintained his fire till ammunition failed and the enemy rushed his position. Captain Bellew then seized a rifle, smashed his machine gun, and fighting to the last, was taken prisoner. And it's worth noting that the survival rate for Victoria Cross winners is roughly 10%. Um, so very low numbers. He's lucky to have survived at all. And Captain Bellew actually lived until 1961 here in Kamloops. Um, he actually got gas poisoning from one of the first gas attacks on the Ypres salient that would affect him for the rest of his life and would actually render him unfit for general service. Um, and it's a little known fact that during the First World War, gas was actually used by both sides um, and in fact was first used by the French, um, although that was tear gas rather than the chlorine and mustard gases we'll see later in the war. It is also a little known fact that many German generals actually refused or strongly resisted the use of gas because it was seen as being a dishonorable war tactic of warfare. The gases that were used were largely mustard gas or chlorine gas. Chlorine, of course, is very heavy and would sink into the trenches. Mustard gas causes blistering to any exposed skin, um, and many soldiers sustain permanent lung damage from exposure. We know from accounts from medics and nurses that deaths from gas exposure were excruciating and lengthy, and soldiers would often arrive in hospital and take several weeks to die from it. So First World War on the ground, what does it look like? Many of us have uh, an image of the First World War in our heads, um, thinking about trench warfare, <clears throat> mud, uh, mud often up to you know hip depth. And there are actually many stories coming out of battlefields such as Passchendaele um, of soldiers who fall off the duck boards and drown in the mud. Disease is prevalent, um, cholera, typhoid, other gastrointestinal illnesses, um, trench fever caused by lice in the seams of clothing, um, scabies, anything communicable, of course, is extremely widespread. And the colds, um, there are cases of tea being brought from the back up to the front, and by the time it gets there, it's frozen solid over the top. 
Um, and I just want to highlight as well, many people have this idea that when soldiers deploy into the First World War, they spend all of their time in the front lines, in the trenches, um, and this is not at all the case. Typically, soldiers would spend between 15 and 25 percent of their time in those forward trenches, um, and the rest would be in reserve trenches further back or even off the line. Um, and there are some pictures that come out of the First World War, um, celebrations of things like Dominion Day, um, and you get the sense of a real brotherhood being built. Um, for some of these soldiers. So it's not all entirely bad all the time. Now, logistics in the First World War are very interesting because it is the first time that we really see large-scale stagnant warfare that sees large numbers of troops in one place. Um, and some accounts actually have troops growing their own vegetables in the trenches. Um, Food at the front is very dull, but everyone is fed, which is in and of itself a minor miracle. It's the first time food preservation is really used um, on a large scale, and you may have seen the tinned rations coming out of the First World War. Here on the home front as well, women um, are knitting socks, they're creating care packages and Red Cross packages that would be sent to prisoners of war. They're making bandages, collar belts, etc. So again, all of those supplies that are heading overseas are coming from here, from women and women's auxiliaries that are being put together and shipped overseas. Now, as the First World War comes to a close, um, many people don't realize that following the First World War, there was very, very little, very limited repatriation of remains. So soldiers are often buried where they fell, in graveyards that lay officers and men next to one another. And the Cenotaph and War Memorial Program in Canada really embraces Canadians' need for justification, consolation, and nationalism surrounding the memory of the First World War. Keep in mind that at the time, the First World War was known as the Great War, and the thought that it might be repeated was unimaginable for many. In a sense, more memorials and cenotaphs helped Canadians to create a usable past, um, to create positive remembrance, and to ensure that Canadians knew that their sacrifice had not been for nothing. Um, and I think it's worth noting as well that it's not just a loss of life, um, many young men dying here, but if you've ever been to Memorial Hill Park, you can take a look at the rock cairn that's just located behind us um, next to Stuart Wood School. And that's actually built with stones for the students from Stuart Wood who died. So not just a large scale loss of life, but also a large scale loss of young life um, here in the Kamloops area. So our cenotaph was built uh, by the Ladies Auxiliary to the Great War Veterans Association. They're the ones who raised the funds. Um, it was put, put to a vote and it was actually originally supposed to be located on the corner of Victoria Street in the 400 block. Um, but business owners feared that the memorial would create heavy traffic and impede access to shops. Um, and if you've been to our Remembrance Day ceremonies, um, I would argue that they are likely correct. So it was moved up here to Battle and Second. Um, and it was created by the Art Monument Company of Victor Vancouver. Um, so they earned the $5,000 contract to construct it. It's made out of gray granite supplied by the Vancouver Granite Company. And W.H. McCauley, uh, Kamloops architect, designed the park that we see around at Memorial Hill Park. Our cenotaph was unveiled on May 24, 1925. So in the scale of the wave of commemoration that sweeps the country um, and most of Europe, relatively early. And it's worth noting that this uh, cenotaph actually originally had cannons and electric lamp posts around it. If you take a look at some of the images from 1925, you can see those things. But they were removed so that materials could be used during the Second World War. Um, and that really tells you something about how desperate the situation was during World War II. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the home front here in Canada during the Second World War. So the Rocky Mountain Rangers, once again, um, are tasked largely with the defense of the home front. Um, particularly with guarding vulnerable points along the railways. So um, it seems unimaginable to us now. We look back and we know that there was never an invasion of the Canadian mainland during the Second World War. Um, but at the time, it was a very present threat um, and people were very concerned about it. Um, and the Rocky Mountain Rangers were also responsible for training reinforcements um, to be sent overseas, particularly non-commissioned uh, officers and officers um, and those ranks especially the non-commissioned officers are most likely to be um, killed or wounded in battle. In a notable training exercise the Rocky Mountain Rangers marched from Kamloops to Vancouver via the Fraser Canyon. Um, it took them 14 days temperatures reached over 40 degrees centigrade and uh, they actually recreated the exercise in 1993. I don't know if they're planning to recreate it in the future um, but it would certainly be interesting to hear about some of those experiences. In a very interesting uh, engagement, the Rocky Mountain Rangers uh, were involved in the Kiska operation, so liberating the Kiska Island in the Aleutians. 
um, which had actually hastily been abandoned 18 days earlier through sheer luck uh, in a foggy patch past the American blockade. Um, bombing though had brought up fresh dirt, pilots continued to report small arms fire, and it was thought that the Japanese had moved into the hills um, to prepare for the final fight. So um, they were very much deploying here uh, in the thoughts that it would be an active engagement, um, active combat but it wasn't and the Rocky Mountain Rangers actually received no battle honors for the Second World War and when we get to the Second World War it becomes much more difficult to research individual soldiers um, due to the fact that Library and Archives Canada has not yet digitized or released the service records so because there are still Second World War veterans with us today um, those records can't be released due to privacy concerns. So the major difference between the First and Second World War is that the First World War is largely a war of attrition. That trench warfare, the expression, bleed them white. Um, so very much the idea that you just continue to send reinforcements to the front um, and eventually one side will run out of reinforcements. The Second World War is very much a war of movement and logistics, um, including the Blitzkrieg style of war, so named for the speed at which uh, German troops move through Europe. Uh, Blitzkrieg, of course, means lightning war, um, and very much moving from town to town, space to space, um, rather than in a stagnant area like the First World War. So this year, I would like to actually take a few minutes to talk about the role that Canadians played in the liberation of Italy, um, and particularly Ortona. Um, least not because the Seaforth Highlanders play an instrumental role here, and many Kamloopsians would have enlisted with the Seaforths who are based in Vancouver. <coughs> so, Operation Husky, which is of course the liberation of Italy, hit the ground running during the amphibious landings in Sicily in July 1993. So Canadian soldiers land on the beaches in Sicily, and it was at the time the largest amphibious his landing in history. So to put this in context, D-Day doesn't happen until almost a full year later in June of 1994 or 1944. Um, and it sort of eclipses, it has this tendency to eclipse the Italian operation, but I think it's a really important feature of the Second World War for Canadians. Fighting in Sicily is intense, but the island fell in 38 days and led the Canadians into the boot of Italy. For the first two months on the Italian mainland, the Germans conducted a fighting retreat, so they moved backwards, um, content simply to inflict casualties and give up territory. As fall narrows into winter, however, the Germans consolidated their forces in the winter line. And this was a defensive network um, that stretched across the country, and it both provided the Germans a high ground advantage um, for their defensive position, but it also blocked the American armies from getting into Rome. And that brings us to Ortona. Ortona, of course, is a small coastal town um, on the eastern side of Italy. Um, and I would argue that this is a defining battle for the Canadians during the Second World War. Um, although this city was of very little strategic importance, it was held by elite troops and they had actually been ordered by Hitler himself to hold the city to the last man. Street fighting here was intense. Um, it was hand-to-hand -hand combat that allowed the Seaforce to essentially write the book on urban combat. In fact, fighting here was so intense that officers were actually brought in from the Eastern Front, um, from Stalingrad, to teach the Canadians how to work their way from building to building. Um, and for those who are familiar with the Second World War, you might know of Stalingrad already, um, almost a war within a war itself, um, a very large battle for a city in Russia, um, then the Soviet Union. During the battle, the Seaforths rotated off the front line to have Christmas dinner in the bombed out ruins of the Santa Maria di Constantinopoli Church, um, which actually still stands in Ortona today. For many, it would be their last meal, and it has become iconic in the history of the regiment. And Ortona becomes known as Little Stalingrad and remains one of the defining battles of the Second World War for Canadians. Now, in the post-war period, um, research becomes even more difficult, of course, because even more of the veterans are still alive, meaning that service records are inaccessible uh, to researchers. Canadians serve, of course, in the Korean War. If you come and visit the Cenotaph, you will notice that there is a plaque to the Korea uh, Korean War on it. Um, troops are actually still deployed in the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea as well. It becomes increasingly difficult to track veterans following the Second World War as well because many active service regiments become reserve units, um, meaning that reservists will serve under regular force units when they see service. So if someone in a reserve unit volunteers for service, they will go and they will serve with a regular force unit and then come home to their reserve unit. Uh, peacekeeping in the post-war period becomes a hallmark for Canadianness and the Canadian Armed Forces. Once again, it becomes virtually impossible to track soldiers, um, at least for now, particularly because Canadian soldiers deploy into a variety of different kinds of missions. 
And there is a common misconception um, that peacekeeping is inherently peaceful. Um, particularly when it's associated with peacekeeping in its earliest forms, such as the peacekeeping mission in the Suez Canal and that on Cyprus. However, peacekeeping missions in the 1990s become complex. Um, questions are raised about peacemaking versus peacekeeping. And these missions include Bosnia, the Rwandan genocide. Um, and I'd just like to point out that the peacekeeping engagement in the Medak pocket in Bosnia was one of the largest combat op engagements for Canadians since the Korean War. Um, so very much still an active combat operation. And to date, Canadians are currently involved in 39 operations around the world. Um, I'd like to also talk a little bit about Afghanistan. So more than 40,000 members of the Canadian Armed Forces served in Afghanistan during operations between 2001 and 2014. Um, and I'd like to focus in on one name in particular, which is Master Corporal Aaron Doyle. And again, if you get an opportunity to come and visit our cenotaph, you will notice his name on here. Uh, Master Corporal Doyle was born in 1976 in Maple Ridge, but grew up in Kamloops. Um, he enlisted in 1998. And he was known to his friends as being a funny, outgoing guy who loved to play pranks and generally cause trouble. Um, he was afraid of heights, bees, and pretty much nothing else. And hopes for the future included becoming a search and rescue technician before retiring to Vailmont with his wife, Nicole, and pumping gas. Um, and he was killed in action on August 11, 2008. Um, and for those of you who might be interested in Master Corporal Doyle, I highly recommend checking out uh, the Legion article about him. It's a really beautiful article and a really compelling read. So thank you so much for joining me, um, and hopefully you'll have a chance to come and visit the Cenotaph yourself, and we'll see you next year.